this week we are having a conversation with Doge and Dyerhawk, who uh, just spent some time at the SVVR conference in San Jose, which is a uh, virtual reality sort of uh, expo. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what uh, they witnessed there and uh, in general how the event went. The main event was basically the the I guess you'd call it the exhibition floor or the show floor, and then where there was a big it was a big space with lots of booths deva- devoted to various developers and companies that were showing off technology, or they were showing off uh, new headsets, or they were showing off virtual reality experiences, or maybe they had other things they bring to the table. There was a lot of different things. For example, there was a section on uh, using virtual reality as a method of uh, uh, wellness, sort of like um, for things like meditation or yoga or whatever. There were there were some people that were showing off uh, virtual reality sound systems, like made to make the sound better. One demo that I you had to sign up to, um, you couldn't just kind of go in. They they were the only one that actually had a booth. It was completely like a sealed box you had to go into, because they were trying to keep everything kind of sealed and they didn't want the press in there. And they didn't want their competition in there. It was Meta 2 with their uh, augmented reality uh, glasses. I wanted to go in there because I had done a pre-order because I want to use augmented reality for um, judging my scale of my 3D models that I want to bring into VR. Because one problem I've had was that I've noticed when creating VR worlds is take things that we take for granted, like furniture and stuff like that. The furniture is always out of scale. You go in there and you could have a couch that's like up to your waist or tables that are you know the wrong scale to your characters so i wanted to be able to overlay um my models that i'm modeling that i have on my computer but have it so it's modeled and then you know overlaid into the real world so i can compare it to real objects so i was very interested in seeing that and i tell you i was blown away by that thing it literally was going into star wars the meta 2 takes up the entire field of view so yeah. that gives it a, an enormous edge over the Microsoft, uh, yeah. Microsoft one. The, the differences between the two, though, um, they both have plus and minuses. Me, I want you know the ability to have you know a full immersive experience, and I want you know the capabilities of the highest you know experience and graphics possible, and that means it's a tethered experience right now. They're working on a wireless. Um, you know, I don't know if it's going to be an add-on or if it's going to be the Meta 3 or what it is. But um, so I opted for the the Meta 2 over the uh, plus. It's half the price. But when you go to Microsoft Hololens, it's like twice the price, and it doesn't have the field of view, but it's completely um, autonomous. It's got its own onboard computer, but you're limited to what what that uh, headset can actually render and you know process. So it's going to have you know, limited functionality. So, hmm. so I mean, you basically have to kind of choose what, you know, the system that will work best for whatever idea you have, what platform you're building for. What were the groups that were predominantly represented? Was it like gaming? Was it social? Was it like, what was the, the biggest sort of um, element would, in, in the VR community? I would say social. I would say social. Everywhere you looked, it was social. Um, even even platforms that weren't specifically talking about social, it was about the idea of um, like there was this one booth, and um, it was the ability to be able to do say presentations and stuff, and uh, have people hop into their into their VR headset, and you can use a web camera, and it will overlay a silhouette of you onto a virtual stage. And when they go into this thing, you'd be sitting in the audience taking in the lecture. Hmm. That would be like a social thing. And the person, another person that would be in there um, being part of that whole thing would be able to, you know, have a chat with you and they'd be beside you. So that's another social thing, but it wasn't purely intended just to go there to hang out with people, but you could talk with other people. There is some, yeah, collaborative I, spaces and stuff. I think that's like the yeah. been the big thing that they've been kind of going towards. 
Well, Magic Leak, uh, they haven't, you know, leaked a lot of information of, you know, how far they are along on this. But f from what I have seen, um, I, I mean, there's a lot of buzz on Magic Leap right now. But what they've been working on is, I, it looks like it's volumetric type stuff, but it's to do with um, augmented reality type stuff. And uh, I don't know what they're using, but they're somehow kind of refracting they're they're kind of projecting the 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 image data into the through the glass itself that's in front of you so there it's some sort of a prism technology but it sounds like you know um you know volumetric kind of way of displaying information <laughs> i can't go into great detail with it but i'm just saying that it it sounds kind of like what you're you're getting at with that. So you know yeah. there are still people working on this. They know that that's well. What I mean, a lot of the displays they do. There, there's a, there's a variety of ways in which they try to do it with uh, you know with like for instance just the uh, going all the way back to those. Um, I remember video games. You know, ten years ago. No shit, longer ago than that. Where they well they what they would have is a uh, is a typical illusionist trick of a like a half silvered mirror uh, set at a at an angle, and so it's actually reflecting something that's below. Uh, you know, a, that's that's below the surface, and you're but you're looking at it, and because it's at an angle, the way that the light plays on it, it looks like it's in three dimensions. But it's because it's the way that it's being projected on a surface, and uh, and and that is is one thing. But what I'm talking about is literally like being able to produce an image in midair, uh, you know, without any without any kind of. In other words, one that you could like sweep your hand through, and in fact, I could actually, oh, I see. yeah, make it I like see. have haptic feedback. Yeah. Well, what it says here for Magic Leap is what they're attempting to do. What it is attempting is a head-mounted virtual retina display, which superimposes, oh. yeah, which superimposes 3D computer-generated gener imagery over real-world objects. So, it projects in your retina. Second Life has already been working on developing their successor, and it's called Sansar. That's S-A-N-S-A-R. And uh, basically, it's a completely immersive virtual reality experience. And uh, I got tipped off about that because I was talking to one of the developers and I was talking about my, that I do photogrammetry and my interest in history and creating, fo you know, completely, you know, um, accurate renderings of actual historic places and buildings and architecture and stuff. And this is the kind of thing they're going for. They're going for, you know, photorealistic, uh, fully immersive experiences. So. And that's going to be the successor to uh, their second life. So we're going to be able to go and see the Great Pyramids, and they will be the actual renders of the Great Pyramids, and uh, be able to go on field trips. And uh, I don't know, the education and social experiences are going to just be amazing. Pretty much everything that you and Jonathan have been saying, I agree with. I think that it has um, a lot of potential as a useful tool for people, you know, whether it's for uh, jobs, for entertainment, for leisure, for education, uh, I think it has all of those things. The only thing, the only thing that I'm concerned with is the dark side of the same potential. It, it's just a tool, right? So, you know, it is a tool that is used to interact with um, data, and it does it in a way that previous tools that we've had can, couldn't do it. You know, we've always tried to immerse ourselves more and more into a medium. You know, we we went from uh, stories that were told, you know, that were just passed on verbally from person to person to the written language, to the print, to, you know, audio and radio, to film and so on, and better special effects, more immersion, video games, how can we get, get deeper? And VR seems to be the, na the next natural step. But like all of the things that preceded it, I, I think that there is something that concerns me. Uh, and it, this isn't something that is the fault of the medium. Like I, I realize that this is just the tool itself. But one thing that I cannot shake is this dreadful feeling. And it has, it has to do with the fact that one of the people that was speaking at the conference was this woman who was talking about the ways in which she would like to use virtual reality to tell stories and to enhance journalism. But when you look deeper at the stuff that she has in mind, it's actually quite terrifying because she's not like all the stuff you guys were talking about. Let's well, say you, 
you you're interested in going into uh, you you want to be a surgeon, and then there is a, a a program that can show you how to you know do surgery in a safe to simulate it in a safe place, you know where you're not hurting anyone or whatever. Or if someone was wanted to learn how to do um, you want to do history, and they wanted to go to different parts of the world, they want to do some virtual tourism, or they wanted to learn about things as they were, whatever it is. Provided that the the people providing the service, providing the the programs and everything, are all working from the the um, the idea that the the point is to be as factual and accurate as possible, that I think that that is a completely healthy thing to do. The problem is is that I have a concern that there are people who don't have those kinds of ends, and they see this as a tool to push stuff that they believe in. Oh and yeah, use this in a way that is actually quite nefarious. Uh, even if the person themselves thinks that they're totally right. Free speech and the maturity of a mind are, are things that we already kind of separate. We don't, you know, we don't necessarily want children to be exposed unless their parents are, are cool with it, but we don't want to just automatically expose children to absolutely every kind of media and every idea and, you know, and, and things of that nature because their minds are not really capable of, of doing as good a job of separating the truth from the falsehood uh, as a more mature mind. And so it's, yeah, as these things become further and, and, and you know, more and more powerful, it will take a, an ever more mature mind to be able to separate. And I, and I think we've already crossed that, that threshold. TV has already cro crossed the threshold. We've got the people who, who they're, even as adults, their minds are not mature enough to really separate the truth from the falsehood. And what do we do about that? You know, you, we can't just go and say, oh, it doesn't matter that you're a, a uh, uh, an adult. You don't you don't get to uh, watch TV because you're not capable. No, of, no, we, uh, you, we, know, so we, you, you don't get to do yeah. that. You know? No, no, we, I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't call for that. But I, I think that. But it's still uh, difficult. I understand what you're yeah, saying. I agree with that. But I think that even like with say with television, uh, people can separate the fact that they're watching television and that they're watching say a fictional drama, even if it says something like you know this was based on real events. There's a difference between yeah, it's not immersive. Tell the difference between watching something that's intended for entertainment and going to school and getting educated on something. Yeah, but yeah. you're talking yeah. about a virtual reality. Not only can they choose to conflate those things and say, because that was the thing about with GamerGate. This was like from years ago, a couple of years back, where there was somebody who blew this whole thing wide open with the uh, Game Developers Conference a couple of years ago, where the central goal of the people that attended the GDC, which are not like, you know, mainstream game developers that for the most part are just looking to turn a profit, but people who instead are up to something a lot more uh, long reaching, where basically they were thinking games should be used as a tool of social justice to educate people. And so what we'll do is we'll use the fact that kids love games as a means to educate them on the ideas that we think are the most important. And that was their aim. And so, and that was actually messed up and, and scary back then because the oh, yeah, it goes further back. I mean, they've been, yeah, uh, people sure. been pushing messages, messages to kids or to whoever based upon what they like since, you know, since there was uh, the possibility of any kind of media at all, since, since printed word was, was even possible. Yeah. And so yeah, saying, it's not, it's weird. not a new problem. It's just become no. a more potent problem. The idea uh, in AI, we've been going on for so long about all the possible ways in which AI could go wrong that people have in general become afraid of it. And this, so the same thing happens anytime that we got that we've got these new technologies. They certainly have dangerous things we need to ch check out. We, they, we, they certainly need to be addressed. We need to be aware of them. But then if we focus so much on those, then we end up fearing it. And, and a lot of times that fear can end up being a uh, self-fulfilling prophecy as I think is part of what's going on with the development of AI is that people are so scared of creating an AI that will, uh, that I, you know, a, uh, an intuitive and like, you know, a, a strong AI that will, that will hate humanity that they're wanting to make sure that, okay, well, we got to make sure to put it in a box and basically torture it, uh, you know, and, and try to half lobotomize it. And, uh, and, and that way it won't hate us, you know, uh, that it's really, 
not the best idea. Then you know, perhaps instead, no. what we need is is our uh, our AI to go past the whole dumb animal phase that we've had to go through slowly and it just warp right straight through it to like the fucking zen monk version of consciousness you know <laughs> it's let's make sure that we don't get it stuck in that halfway between point that that humanity's been going through for a real long time 